Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Mikel Del Rosario, Cultural Engagement Manager here at the Hendricks Center. And our topic on the table today is Jesus and history. Jesus and history. It is no... Uh, exaggeration to say that Jesus is at the very least one of the most influential figures in human history. Countless people talk about him every day, and that's outside the church too. But sometimes, especially around Christmas and Easter, when Christians are talking to their friends about Jesus, uh, they get interesting questions about uh, maybe things their friends have seen on TV, things they've seen on YouTube or read in a popular book. They get questions like, was Jesus married? Was Jesus a zealot? Even did Jesus really die on the cross? And so today I'm very pleased to have two expert guests joining us to talk about the historical Jesus. First guest coming to us all the way from Australia is John Dixon. John was the founding director of Australia's Center for Public Christianity, and today he is a distinguished fellow and senior lecturer in public Christianity at Ridley College in Australia. Welcome, John. Hey, thanks for having me. I don't know why you need me here when Daryl's here. I've got half of his books over on those shelves and the other half of his books over on that <laughs> shelf, but you know, whatever. Well, you're doing a really good job talking about uh, this down under where uh, the situation is a little bit different from us here in North America. So it's great to we have some good coverage, uh, international coverage as well. And second guest coming to us also via Zoom all the way from across the street at Dallas uh, Seminary's Hendricks Center is Dr. Daryl Bach. Executive Director of Cultural Engagement and Senior Research Professor of New Testament here at DTS. Daryl, welcome to the show once again. My pleasure to be back, and it's fun to be in a different seat. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool to have both of you on the show today because we are talking about the historical Jesus, something that's near and dear to uh, all of our hearts. Um, but certainly, uh, you, we, we have you having working worked in this for decades and John doing his work in Australia as well. Now, there is a huge academic discipline that many people don't know about. Um, called Historical Jesus Studies. And when sometimes uh, skeptics will say, we're not really sure we can know very much about Jesus, um, they're kind of behind the times in terms of academia because this is this is not something that, that academics have talked about um, in terms of, well, we can't really know hardly anything about Jesus for, for many, many decades. But just help us, Daryl, get oriented to this, this academic discipline in terms of how do scholars who are from all walks of life, from all different religious commitments, or, or even to no faith, how do they look at Jesus as a historical figure and begin to study the things we can know about him? Well, they do it the way they look at any figure. They look at the historical sources, the historical remnants of what exists, uh, whether it be in text or in uh, what we call realia, which are the things that have been left behind in the, in the culture that archaeologists find, that kind of thing. And they um, put that all together and say, the first question is, of course, did Jesus exist? I like to tease my students that if you get me in an ordination exam, a question I'm going to ask them is, um, tell me how you can show that Jesus exists, but you cannot cite a Christian source in order to make the case. And, and then we're off and running. We're talking about the testimony of Josephus, which some people dispute, but which a wonderful video that John did with Chris Forbes uh, basically walks through in about five minutes to show Josephus did write about a, a historical Jesus. And then, and then other uh, remnants of evidence that exist that clearly indicate that he exists. The whole Jewish tradition that reacts to Jesus only reacts if he existed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so there are lots of grounds. But the historical Jesus study is an attempt to argue for Jesus on the basis in which everyone pursues history in the humanities. That's the simple way to say it. Now, that doesn't mean it's an easy discipline because worldviews impact what you see and read and how you react. And the Bible challenges worldviews because it has things in it like miracles, which, um, which are not impervious to worldview impact, if I can say it that way. They actually impinge on worldviews in terms of how you read it. So if you have a worldview that doesn't allow space for miracles, but you encounter a story that has miracles in them, you've got to come up with another explanation for what's going on. And so sometimes that's what happens. And the roots of historical Jesus study, and this will be the last thing I say, the roots of historical Jesus study um, are 
did begin with a skepticism towards the Bible, which has meant that conservatives, generally speaking, have been very hesitant to engage, at least until recently, in significant ways with historical Jesus attempts because of its, um, its problematic roots, if I can say it that way, in terms of where it came from. So all of this figures in. Uh, and so when you hear the phrase historical Jesus, you know, you might get a blood pressure reaction, depending <laughs> on how aware someone is about what's behind it, um, but it is a good way to have a conversation with someone who doesn't share your faith to be aware of how to make those arguments in ways that someone who doesn't need to have a faith can appreciate as you talk about Jesus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's not like, well, I don't believe the Bible, so we can't have a conversation when you're talking to your skeptical friend. Um, no, actually, people who are atheists, people who are Jewish, people uh, of all different faiths can actually come together, come to the table, and we do have a way to begin talking about um, things that Jesus said and did and, and investigate those things historically. Now, John, when some people look at the historical evidence for Jesus, for just in general, and then also the things Jesus said and did, um, some Christians think that they have almost a higher standard that they try to apply to the data uh, versus if you were just looking at like Julius Caesar or Caesar Augustus or somebody else in history. Uh, why do you think there's that pushback when it comes to Jesus in history? <laughs> well, because uh, Julius Caesar didn't make uh, the same level of claim. Uh, he came close a couple of times, uh, and certainly his propaganda machine did. Um, hmm. Jesus did. And so, the, you know, the, the claim spooks us. And so uh, there's a kind of immediate resistance. And apart from anything else, Jesus became the most influential figure in world history. And so uh, th because the implications of that are so great, I think people are uh, particularly uh, rigorous and, 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 and there's a great big skeptical pushback. And uh, I'm, I'm sure Daryl has found this as well. Uh, but, but over my years sort of playing between, you know, sort of theological seminaries and ancient history classics departments in secular universities, uh, I reckon there's no one who takes a more skeptical uh, approach to the New Testament than New Testament theologians. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, classicists, like, you know, just general classicists who are studying, you know, Arians, Anabasis of Alexander or whatever, um, are nowhere near as sort of fine-tuned skeptic about every line. Hmm. It's a really weird thing. And I've had Roman historians say to me, um, what is it with New Testament theologians? Why are they so skeptical with their documents? You know, um, they're, they're written so close in time to the events. We have so many manuscript copies of them. What, what's, what's wrong? And I, and I think actually what you're seeing is so much depends on this Jesus story mm -hmm. from the worldview perspective that Daryl mentioned, that there is a there is a more intense pushback about these particular first century documents than I think you find in other first century documents uh, generally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to say that John is trained as an ancient historian. So uh, when he wasn't playing music and in a band uh, <laughs> in his former life, uh, and so he trained uh, in, in an ancient his historical context, he's, he's circulated in those in those circles, you know, all my training is basically New Testament related. So, um, so he speaks of an area that he knows because he's interact with these classicists as he's done his own work in historical Jesus work. And he was prepared to interact with the Jesus materials in light of that uh, ancient historiographical study and background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, in fact, John wrote a book, Is Jesus History? which uh, talks about this. And, and in this book, uh, one of the things that, that he mentions is a social media challenge that he put out to uh, atheists and anybody else, really, who wants to see him eat a page out of his own Bible, if. If, John, you want to tell us about that? Here it is. I've got my Bible ready. <laughs> I reckon Matthew chapter 1 would be appropriate, the opening of the story. Is that there. a sweetest yeah. page in the Bible or something? I, mean, I, would, I would really make a selection before I put on a bet like that. <laughs> well, you know, I just think if I get found out, I'll, I'll chop it up and put it on Vegemite toast, Daryl. And, Vegemite, uh, oh, man. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah. be able to yeah, taste the Bible. To explain that to the American audience. Oh, so Vegemite. Vegemite? The, I want to hear the greatest definition of 
Vegemite. It's very simple. You just look it up in the dictionary and it says the the greatest uh, bread uh, paste you've ever tried. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but okay, so my challenge uh, <laughs> made in a rush of blood to the head some years ago was hmm. that if someone can find just one professor of classics or ancient history or New Testament in a secular university anywhere in the world who argues Jesus never lived, I will eat a page of my Bible. <laughs> and when I did that, Twitter Twitter sort of exploded as it does uh, for, for a little while and people were throwing professor names at me. Uh, but they turned out they were all professors of, I mean, obviously there were some professors of theology because, you know, for the reasons I just mentioned, they are weirdly more sceptical uh, than classicists. But uh, there was a professor of poetry, a professor of folklore. There's even that famous professor of German language, Daryl, that, yes. <laughs> that, that we all talk about, um, G.A. Wells. Um, but no professor of classics or ancient history or New Testament in a secular university. And, and I was very precise in my language. I mean, you do find the occasional person who got a PhD in the discipline, Um I mean, obviously, Richard Carrier is, is, is a big name. Uh, he, he, he got a, you know, a decent PhD in an ancient history department and now is a full-time blogger and speaker on behalf of, um, of the sort of the atheist cause. Now, he, he argues Jesus didn't live, but that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about people who have actually got what we call in the British and Australian tradition tenured professorship. In, and then there are thousands of them, right? It's not like this is too narrow. Thousands of these characters... Who, who argues Jesus didn't live? Find, find me one. Well, they, they are still looking. In fact, I, I landed in accidentally on an um, online conversation with a little Australian atheist group who um, were saying that they were still looking and uh, they plan to come into my office when they find such a professor and uh, with a camera, with a camera crew and, uh, and force me to eat my page of the Bible. So mm -hmm. I've got my speech worked out already. I've got Matthew one uh, primed and uh, Vegemite up. toast always in the pocket. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm ready. And my, and my basic, my speech to camera for them would simply be, so you found one. Yeah. You found one. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the, the point being here is that it's not just that, well, almost virtually all uh, professors who study this uh, for a living realize that, that Jesus lived and existed. It's that these Jesus mythers, as I like to call them, who, who say that Jesus never existed, are so far out of the mainstream. This is like flat earther stuff. This is uh, really extreme out there stuff. Um, I love how Bart Ehrman, who is the agnostic, uh, most famous agnostic New Testament professor, who says, whether we like it or not, Jesus existed. Um, certainly, even if you want to rail against Christianity, the best way to do it is not to deny what virtually every historian on the planet um, agrees upon, which is that Jesus was a real person and he really existed. And look, there's a really simple way for the, you know, the person outside of scholarship to um, prove that there is a settled consensus about Jesus. I can prove it, right? I'm not saying I can prove Jesus existed. I'm saying I can prove that secular historical scholarship has no doubts at all about whether Jesus of Nazareth lived. And what you do is you go to any major library, any university library, and you pick up the Oxford Classical Dictionary, which is just up there on my shelf here, 1,600 pages compendium of all things Greek and Roman, uh, produced by scholars, for scholars, as the compendium of all things we know. And you turn to the section on Christianity and you will find several paragraphs that begin to just outline what we know of the historical Jesus. And zero doubt is raised. Zero doubt is mm -hmm. raised about whether this figure really lived. You mm -hmm. could do it again with up there is volume 10 of the Cambridge Ancient History, which deals with the Augustan period. Entirely secular account. Of, uh, of ancient history. Turn to the section on the birth of Christianity, and there are several pages written by a famous classicist about what we know of the historical Jesus. Mm -hmm. We could go on and on with this. The Brill New Pauli, right, which, which Daryl will know, not, not many people know. It's the, this is like the, the greatest, I think, 25 volume um, uh, scholarly account of the classical world, right? I've read it, the table of contents. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, and if any if anyone has a, a, a lazy six thousand euro they want to throw my way, I'll be able to say, and there it is on my bookshelf. But anyway, um, you go to this. There's an actual essay on on Jesus there in this. It's an entirely secular compendium, and it's five thousand five hundred words long. Hmm. Right, just on the historical Jesus, and you'll get a sense of what secular historians are very confident is is real, and there's no hint that we're dealing with a fictitious character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my I point. Did, I, I did an essay in a volume entitled, I don't know, four or five views on the historical Jesus. I don't remember how many there were now, but we had a, a Jesus is myth guy in the in the mix, and uh, when Jimmy Dunn wrote his response, he basically said that no classical scholar doubts um, that Jesus existed and that this view is really portrayed it as really being way out on the fringe with very little to, 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 um, to commend it. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, this is that part that Jesus existed. I mean, think about it for a second. Why would you even have a historical Jesus discipline if historical Jesus never existed? I mean, mm. just, I mean, don't, mm-hmm, don't, mm-hmm. that's why I get my hairline. <laughs> Questions like that. <laughs> well, I, I am uh, honored to work with somebody who can call DG Dunn Jimmy and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and Tom Wright. Um, so when we think about these sources, okay, we're talking about sources like, Daryl, you mentioned Josephus. Let's just go there for a minute. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, there's a lot of question about Josephus. I'm not sure if we can use him as a source, but tell us about how actual Josephus scholars um, take a look at this section in Antiquity. I certainly recognize that the text as we have it has been doctored. There are three places in the text that say things that only a Christian would say, and everyone who's done work on the historical Josephus, okay, mm-hmm. would say, um, one thing we know about Josephus is he was not a Messianic Christian. He was not a Jewish Christian. So, um, so, but you strip that away, and you have what's left, a declaration that Jesus existed, that he did unusual works, um, that he is responsible for the origins of Christianity. I mean, all the some of the core elements of what the New Testament shows are there. And then there's another text and later on in Antiquities Book 20. The mm-hmm. citation is in Book 18, 63, and 64. But when you go to Book 20, 200, I, I cite these verses because I have my devotions in them regularly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, when you go to 2200, you will see an allusion back to the so-called Christ, an allusion that does not make any sense at all as a throwaway remark, mm-hmm. unless there has been a reference to this person somewhere in this vo- in these volumes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, so that pretty much suggests that Josephus did have a discussion of Jesus that fits in the right section, where there is a discussion of those who were, who were perceived to be agitators in Judea uh, during, during the time of Pilate and others. And so, um, so you know, so it's it, it fits where it belongs, et cetera. So that m- almost all classical, I I think we could almost say it this way: almost almost all classical scholars recognize that Josephus did say something about the historical Jesus. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, the the additions actually are part of the giveaway. Uh, I mean, you can hear two voices when you when you read, uh, particularly the book eighteen paragraph. Uh, you know, at this time, uh, there was a wise man, if indeed one can call him a man. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can even hear the two voices there, right? One, yeah. Josephus, who who was happily happily calling Jesus a wise man, and and some later editor, some scribe, who either wrote it in the margin and then it was later inserted, or just was bold enough to insert it, if one can call him a man. Uh, you can hear the two voices right there. It's a giveaway that what mm-hmm. we should really be looking for, the explanation for for this passage the best explanation is is that it's a modified passage some naughty christian has tried to improve improve the jesus okay. and, and, and like the, the two I, sorry the, I like sorry it. i'll just add the two yeah. best articles the t- technical peer-reviewed articles on this question were written by very famous scholars neither of whom is a christian one is gaze of amesh who wrote uh, a really a classic article on the josephus testimony and the other is by james carlton Paget from uh, from cambridge university and uh, and they are just 
beautiful examples of subtle, uh, relatively unbiased uh, classical approach to this ancient Greek text. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just going to say my favorite edition is the third edition, which uh, the third editorial edition, which um, basically, as a result of the resurrection, speaks about this and ten thousand other things, marvelous things that Jesus did. And I like to tease my students that I can hear the Hallelujah chorus going in the background when you read that edition. <laughs> so uh, you know, so I mean, so that you you read it, you read this section, and I like the two voices idea. Because even the description of Jesus as a miracle worker mm-hmm. is put in very neutral terms by Josephus. He uses the word paradoxa erga, exactly paradoxa right. erga, weird yeah. deeds. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, unusual things. I mean, there are lots of ways yeah. to translate. We could have yeah. a living or a or a you know or an RSV translation of it, but mm-hmm. still, the point is, um, you can see a very neutral expression of who Jesus is on the one hand, and then this more exalted set of additions next to it but something's got to trigger that yeah. um you know you don't get the you don't you don't <laughs> you don't make up a statement that has two contrasting voices within it i mean it just mm-hmm. doesn't make and don't, and don't you love the last line daryl after 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 the one you just quoted about ten thousand other things he fulfilled among us and then it goes uh and the tribe of christians has still not disappeared to this day yeah, <laughs> it's like exactly. he expects it to disappear anytime soon. But <laughs> yeah. and, my goodness, they're still here. Of course, when we come to second century Roman historians, you get remarks like, um, you know, all things gathered together in Rome were all problematic. This is paraphrasing, paraphrasing. We're all problematic things, you know, land. So, I mean, mm. it's clear that that, um, uh, in fact, uh, um, the u- word superstition, which is a classic Roman word for religious activity that someone doubts Mm -hmm. um, appears in one of these second century Roman citations. And so we're, you know, everyone is recognizing there's, there's something here. And then the people who don't believe say, well, there's been a lot of stuff added to this alongside. And then you've got the Christians who say, no, it's all, it all really did happen. And you've got your worldview difference right there in the early give and take on assessing who Jesus is, which ended up producing what centuries down the road became the quest for the historical Jesus. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, so we mentioned Josephus. Of course, there's a variety of other um, sources that you can go to, but Josephus is a first century Jewish historian, and he's writing about the Jewish uh, involvement in Jesus' death. You can go outside uh, the Jewish uh, writings. You can find Tacitus, who's a Roman historian, who's writing about the Roman involvement in, G- in Jesus' death. And so, even outside the Bible, it's pretty amazing, actually, how much we can learn about Jesus, even before getting to the actual text of the New Testament. But, John, for those people who now uh, want, to, want to say, okay, here's the Bible, we can see that, that secular sources outside the Bible can point us to the Bible. For their friends who say, I'm not so sure I'm comfortable reading this book because I don't believe in the Bible, we can't use these Christian sources, how would you respond to that uh, idea that we can't use Christian sources to study Jesus? Well, I mean, it makes no sense. Can you not use any Jewish sources like Josephus to understand Jewish history? There you Can go. you not That's use good. Tacitus because he's a Roman and you can't trust anything he tells us about Rome? It, it, it begins to just not make any sense. You end up not being able to believe anyone uh, who who thinks something? Right? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, you you can't tell me that you th- you know that you think that because you think that, right? <laughs> we're, we're we're left we're left in a going nowhere. So um, classicists are just very happy going. Oh sure, Tacitus had his bias or his perspective is probably a better way to put it. Um, you know, he loved one tradition of you know, the Roman Empire and he hated another tradition, and that's so obvious in his writings. We just read him in that context. Doesn't mean he made up things whole cloth, but it does colour his perspective. Josephus also has a double bias. Josephus is mm-hmm. writing for a Roman audience, but he's mm-hmm. also a Jew. He, he's got a little bit of um, uh, self-justification going on because he he, uh, he he was known to have betrayed his own Jewish people, and so there's a little bit of self-justification, but he kind of wears it on his sleeve. And so once you know these these um, perspectives, you can read him. Um, it's unlikely that he's making stuff up, and we can so often verify the things that Tacitus or Josephus say just in passing, that we know they're not making it up whole cloth, uh, but we read it with perspective. It's the same with the New Testament, and that is the really important thing. Classicists open the New Testament 
knowing that it was a first century uh well it, it wasn't even one document it's separate documents you know mm -hmm. you've got to actually th you can't think that mark and paul were you know the letters of paul were in a volume in the first century right they they weren't they, they were separate writings and so classicists open them up and go well, we we're pretty confident these were written in the first century uh in the case of paul's letters pretty pretty much in the middle of the first century uh mark a little bit later that's pretty close in time i mean compared to you know tacitus we we read tacitus for the life of tiberius but tacitus is writing 80 years after mm -hmm. tiberius is dead right at least with paul's letters He's only uh, not even 20 years after uh, after Ty uh, Tiberius dies. Mm -hmm. So um, we're reading early documents. Uh, just read them as human documents. Don't come with sceptical prejudice, a sort of arbitrary prejudice, the way, you know, some of our sort of skepti net people do uh and and don't don't come with the kind of the the pious credulity that that christians do you know uh just come and read them as human documents and uh you'll you'll find that just reading them as human documents opens up an eno enormous set of genuine possibilities uh, about knowing this figure from the life of jesus um so what historians do just as basic method um, and this is true, as Daryl said, it's true of you know, studying Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar. They read all of the available documents that touch on this figure, right? They read them all with a completely open mind, but then they read those primary documents about the figure against the backdrop of everything we know about Rome, about Judea, about Galilee, the, the archaeology, the, 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 the written background sources, and see if this the figure in the primary sources, in the direct witnesses, fits plausibly with what we know in the background. That's the main historical principle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when you do that with the New Testament, it just looks like Jesus was a Galilean Jew in the early first century uh, who had a particular vision of the kingdom of God and had a particularly uh, liberal approach to some things, a very conservative approach to other things, uh, and winded up uh, clashing with the Jerusalem authorities and, and died on a cross. Mm -hmm. Those things just are facts. And he fits in the Jewish backdrop of apocalyptic expectation about what the end is going to be about. So um, um, John has mentioned, you know, the Greco-Roman kinds of sources for the most part. But you put that in a Jewish milieu as well, which is mixed. It's a mixed Jewish Hellenistic background. You go to things like the Dead Sea Scrolls. You look at the apocalyptic expectations and documents beyond Daniel in what we call the Apocryphal pseudepigrapha, what's technically known as Second Temple literature, and lo and behold, you go this. He drops Jesus, drops into a world in which he makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, um, and 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 scholars work with that. Now there are fine points that get debated. I'm you know, uh, a week away from writing a piece on John the Baptist and John the Baptist's relationship to Jesus, in which this apocalyptic background is a major player that they share in terms of their perspective, et cetera. And there are all kinds of fine points that we'll be discussing as scholars with one another about what those relationships were and what Jesus' relationship to John the Baptist was that are very, very discussable and not always completely clear. But what you can say, and my, my piece is going to be entitled, What We Know About John the Baptist and Why It Matters, and, and, and the emphasis is going to be that Jesus fits into the same Jewish apocalyptic world that John the Baptist was operating in. And that's something most scholars who work technically in this area recognize. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you go from there. So what often happens in historical Jesus discussions, and this is tricky for Christians, is you're trying to prove by a set of mostly secular standards, I think it'd be fair to say, uh, what you can show about Jesus. And so you end up not being able to prove everything, but you can make a very good case for a lot of basic things that make sense out of Jesus, even as we know him in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so that difference is a problem for some people, but in discussions with people who do not share your worldview, it's actually a very significant distance to be able to come mm -hmm. in having the conversation. And that's the value of, uh, that you gain from people who pursue this, including conservative scholars who pursue this, because they help you bridge those, some of those gaps with what, what you could on any standard say to someone 
on a historical basis, we can be reasonably confident that we know this. Mm -hmm. Can I offer a couple of um, examples, Michael, sure. um, of what Daryl is saying, specific examples that sort of bear out this <clears throat> Jewish background and how Jesus you know, the figure of Jesus leaps from the page, as it were. Um, you, you take something like his his expression, the kingdom of God. Now, everyone agrees that the kingdom of God is sort of this primary motif, but it's actually not a big motif in the Tanakh or the Hebrew scriptures, the the, the Old Testament. And nor is it, uh, interestingly, a, a, a big deal uh, or very um, often mentioned in the later, well, like in the Paul in Paul's letters or in Peter or even in the... Um, the Didache or one Clement, the, the later literature, right? But in Jesus, it's everywhere. So what's going on there, right? Um, what what explains is when you when you open the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, um, you suddenly see this kingdom of God language uh, quite often. You open the Psalms of Solomon, written shortly before the time of Jesus, a Jewish sort of patriotic poem, the Psalms of Solomon, speak of the kingdom of God coming in power. And so suddenly Jesus looks like he really only fits in this particular time and place in discussions about the kingdom of God, mm. this great, you know, the, the coming of God's reign in, mm -hmm. into history. An another would be um, uh, the, the way Jesus did um, act out his message. He didn't just preach the message. He acted it out. So everyone knows the clearing of the temple. Um, that that you know he's overturning the tables as a as a symbol of the overturning of uh, well the bringing of God's judgment, uh, the collection of twelve disciples only twelve not eleven not thirteen this is a very suspicious activity his whining and dining with sinners what what's going on there this fits perfectly in the Jewish context doesn't fit the later you know context of Christians going into the Roman world it fits perfectly with what we know signs prophets were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you see examples in the Old Testament, of course, uh, Ezekiel having to eat bread baked over cow manure, was it, Daryl? Uh, you know, in public, uh, he had to set up a little model of Jerusalem and attack it in public. These signs, right? We know a few signs prophets directly before Jesus. John the, uh, John the Baptist is almost certainly a signs prophet taking people out to the Jordan River to begin Israel's journey again. And Jesus fits into that context as well, not just preaching, but doing signs you expect of a Jewish, Jewish prophet. We could mm -hmm. go on with little examples, but yeah. this is the sort of thing that makes the historian go, hang on, we are dealing very much with a real first century mm -hmm. Galilean Judean story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me put two two of these examples together. One that John mentioned, let me add one and, and underscore the point. And that is, take the title Son of Man, which is Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. Mm. Okay? Basically, once you get outside the gospel, well, it's always on, only on the lips of Jesus for the most part. Once you get outside the gospels, you hardly ever see it. But this is his favorite way to refer to himself, almost an exclusive. It's an exclusive way that he refers to himself because no one else refers to himself with this title. Mm -hmm. Where does that come from? I mean, if you're arguing that the church put this into his mouth, then why isn't the church putting it in everybody's mouth in the stuff that comes later? Mm -hmm. Kingdom of God is a similar kind of thing. It shows up occasionally, so it's not quite to the same degree as Son of Man, but it's the same kind of thing. Why would these distinct emphases that are in our sources are coming directly and almost exclusively from Jesus, all of a sudden when we get to the later Christian documents, get expressed in completely different terms, even though conceptually we're dealing with fundamentally the same kinds of concepts? Obviously, you're getting an echo of the real Jesus in that stuff, mm -hmm. and that's that that's the conclusion someone should come to. Um, well, if I've got the Jesus who preaches the kingdom of God, and I've got the Jesus who claims to be the Son of Man, which, of course, it, when tied to Daniel is a figure who receives authority from the ancient of days, I've come a pretty long way in terms of the way the Gospels are portraying who Jesus is. I can I, I tease people. I can do a lot of work. I can do a lot of Christian damage, if you will, if I've got the kingdom of God and the Son of Man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the Son of Man is so interesting to me. And uh, Daryl, you know this full well because you're supervising my dissertation on Jesus' claims. And I love the Son of Man in uh, Mark 2 and Mark 14. Uh, I think that there's a wonderful connection there uh, that's really, really interesting to pursue. But I think for, for agnostics and atheists, some of our more skeptical neighbors, it's surprising to them sometimes when they find that actually 
professional uh, historians and scholars who study Jesus for a living actually spend most of their time in the New Testament texts and in the Gospels and in Paul. Um, and so Daryl wrote a book called um, uh, Studying the Historical Jesus. So for those who are listening, that's a great introduction to the sources that I commend to you um, to check out. We are slowly coming to the to the end of our time here, and uh, we have, I just want to signal to our listeners, we do have a couple of different shows that talk about historical evidence for things like the crucifixion of Jesus, for things like the empty tomb, arguments for the resurrection of Jesus based on the evidence that we can uh, talk about historically. But I like to play a little game, guys, sometimes with, with Google and with YouTube, and I'll type something in like, was Jesus and just observe what the autocomplete gives me, because that gives you an idea of what people are, are searching for, uh, typing into Google. And um, even, you know, was Jesus really crucified? Like, really, people are asking that? Actually, yes. Um, but a couple of these ones that I just want to touch on before we end our show today is one that I got last Easter from a Christian uh, who went to my church, who read a book, and uh, was curious about it. Was Jesus married? Now. How would we go about just helping someone think through that particular question? Uh, Daryl, I'll ask you. You wrote, you wrote a little thing in Breaking the Da Vinci well, Code about again, that. You've got to ask where the sources are. Now, there was a lot of hubbub about a decade ago about a text that supposedly said that Jesus was married. Uh, subsequent research on, on this text uh, showed that it was basically a fraud, that mm -hmm. it was completely fraudulent. Uh, when this came up with the Da Vinci Code uh, at the turn of the millennium, um, makes it sound more impressive when you say it that way. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and, and people look to see what the evidence was. Um, there, there isn't any real evidence that Jesus was ever married. And so um, uh, it, it's a speculation. I mean, it'll start with an observation like, well, most Jewish men were supposed to get married and pursued marriage. That's true, okay? But Jesus wasn't like most Jewish men. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and, and, and the tradition in, in Matthew about Jesus' remarks about divorce and the remark about being able to be a eunuch, okay, and that some people are capable, tells you there is another form of existence that can, be, that can uh, take place, that kind of thing. So, so, so there isn't really much evidence that Jesus got. I've got to quickly tell you a series story. Uh, that I once mm. played in front of the students. Uh, I was on my phone right when Siri came out, and I said, who is Jesus Christ? And Siri's voice blares out over the iPhone in front of these students. Ask a religious expert. <laughs> <laughs> Siri didn't want to direct you Siri, to the uh, classical library. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pity uh, they didn't say, ask a classicist. I anyway. know, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, your day's coming. <laughs> John, let me throw this, this one out to you as we come to the end of our time here. Another one is, was Jesus a zealot? There is another uh, popular book called Zealot um, that made that <laughs> affirmation. Uh, how have you In responded fact, to that? <laughs> right here. Behold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Razor Aslan. Um, yeah, was Jesus a zealot? Let me make it nice and simple. No. <laughs> and uh, virtually no one thinks that. I mean, way back in the 1700s, uh, uh, Herman Samuel Rymaris uh, argued this mm -hmm. point. He dismissed everything uh, magical about Jesus and said, well, what, what would be the most likely figure? And he looked at a few Jewish sources and said, oh, they were sometimes rebels. So that's what he was. And he started with this thesis, excluded everything that didn't fit with it as a later accretion to the Jesus story and said he was a rebel. So hardly anyone believed him. <laughs> hardly anyone has believed him ever since. Um, and then Reza Aslan tried to... Uh, uh, resurrect uh, this thesis. I mean, it falls down on so many levels. If you just if you just approach it from a historical point of view, uh, there are too many different lines of evidence pointing to Jesus using kingdom of God language in a really uh, upended way. That it's really about. Uh, the meek inheriting the earth, that it's about the peacemakers, uh, it's about little children, uh, it's about the smallest mustard seed. There are so many ways in which Jesus drives home in, in parables, in sayings, in Mark, in sayings, in Q. And then you can go to Paul's letters where it's clear that Paul's Jesus traditions already in the 50s are about love and humility and so on. 
Mm-hmm. Um, all these lines of evidence point to the fact that Jesus was not a zealot looking for a political overthrow uh, of the government. Mm-hmm. He thought that actually uh, the real job of the Messiah was to enter into the fury of God. So I'm, I'm picking up sort of Albert Schweitzer's language at the beginning of the 20th uh, century. Um, enter into the fury of God, bear the great suffering, trial, judgment of the world so that everyone might come into the kingdom of God. That really does seem like the only plausible uh, account. He, mm-hmm. he upends the notion of violent revolution. Yeah, when you think about a zealot, and a zealot really was about overthrowing Rome violently, okay, it's actually the antithesis of what Jesus was. Jesus was a rebel, and there's no doubt that he was the bringer of a revolution at a social level, but it didn't have a single sword attached to it. Mm. And so that makes him an anti-zealot. Hmm. Well, with just a few minutes left, there is one more thing I wanted to ask, John, because uh, we're kindred spirits in, in a number of ways. Uh, one, we both love studying the historical Jesus and doing um, public Christianity stuff. Uh, we used to be in bands, and also, I used to collect coins. <laughs> and somebody went to the Vatican and got me this. And these are, these are not as cool as what you have because these are reproductions. But I have here a denarius of Augustus. It says 27 BC to 14 AD. And I keep this in my office. And when I saw that you wear a denarius around your neck, I've wanted to ask you on the air to explain why that is. Uh, yeah. So I, I wear this uh, denarius. Uh, it's a real one. <laughs> um, it picks up from where Augustus left off uh, because it's Tiberius's date, uh, 14 to 37. AD. And um, yeah, I've collected coins uh, for you know two decades. And um, I, I've been wearing this one for a very long time. Uh, you know, partly because it's the coinage referred to when Jesus, you know, was asked, should you pay taxes to Caesar? He said, whose image is on it? We assume when he said, you know, when they say it's it's Caesar's image, we, we assume they're referring to uh, Tiberius with a denarius. So, you know, it's this coin. I'm not saying it so is you're ready this to very pay. coin. <laughs> you're ready this to coin. Pay, right, John? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could be. Um, so, uh, so it's got that connection for me. But, but the other reason I wear it is just, it's a great reminder to me that all these things we're talking about were once just as real and solid as this piece of silver is around my neck. Like I'm touching it now. I can feel it. I am now transported back 2000 years ago. I think, you know, what meals did this buy? What lodgings did it pay for? What sordid dealings uh, did it pay for? Who was the poor mug who lost it (laughs) only to be found (laughs) nearly 2000 years later? Um, You know, but these events we're talking about didn't occur in Middle Earth you know, mm-hmm. the land of the hobbits. Uh, it's you, the, the Jesus story is just as much a part of the history of the Middle East as, as this, this coin is around my neck. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, you know, when I was in college, one thing that really struck me as I got serious about my faith is that if what we're talking about is really true and there's no such thing as, uh, there's no difference between religious truth, quote unquote, and regular actual everyday truth, if Jesus really is who he claimed to be, Jesus really lived, he really died, he really rose from the dead. If Christianity is really true, then it has to change my whole life. And Christianity is either true or it's not. And Jesus, if he is who he claimed to be, is worth living and dying for. So thank you guys yeah, so I'll much say for that. Thanks so much for joining us. John, thank you again. Thank you. And thanks, Daryl, for being an expert guest with us today as well. I'm glad to do it. And if I ever have to pay a Roman tax, I know who to go to to get the <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I owe you in so many ways, Daryl. <laughs> so maybe. <laughs> well, we thank you so much for joining us on the table today. Uh, please do subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope to see you again on the table where we discuss issues of God and culture. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.